I, I always tell kids, you know, you have to have the radar up yeah. all the time, yeah. all yeah. the time, scanning. Yeah. You know, what's the bass player doing? What's the piano player doing? What am I doing? Yeah. You know, am I too loud? Am I too soft? I mean, you, ha you have to look at everything all the time, especially because when you're playing jazz, you're taking chances. Antonio, thanks so much for coming by. I enjoyed so much having time with you in Milwaukee at Cassio Music for their drummer festival. Mm -hmm. I played, you played, we played together. You sounded fantastic. And then you were back on the road with Pat Metheny hitting the road hard. Yeah, we're, I was in the middle of a tour when, when that happened. <laughs> when that happened it right? just happened that I was in Milwaukee that day <laughs> with him and it just worked out. It was, it was incredible. But it was, it was a blast How great. playing with you and just inspiring to see you doing your thing. You know, it's, it's always great. Well, the inspiration for me was easy to steal because as you were talking, not only are you, are you articulate in how you were able to speak to the audience about how to, how to feel music and understand music, but then you played, and your dynamic range and your level of expression is spontaneous, it's in the moment, it's in the now, it's exciting, and everyone just was moved by it all. So, fantastic, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, it's been like my, my lifelong ambition to try to get as much emotion out of the kid as possible, as mm -hmm. a solo instrument. Interesting. Since I was a kid, even though I was playing along to records of, uh, you know, Ringo Starr and, and Charlie Watts, Led Zeppelin, John Bonham, Neil Peart, Stuart Copeland, you know, the, yeah. the usual suspects, I would always just be on my own improvising for hours. I would just like press record on the little cassette deck I had <laughs> and just record myself and then listen to it. So I was always interested in researching uh, sounds, researching storytelling, yeah. you know, within, I, I would play like, you know, uh, you know, an hour drum solo and just record it and, and then try to, to find some sense uh, to it and what worked, what didn't work. And nowadays that's, that's what I enjoy doing, mm. uh, you know, mostly is just really telling stories from the drums if I'm playing with a band or if I'm playing by myself. You know, it's all about storytelling for me nowadays. Well, it's beautiful because it really was that clear. When you played, it was a composition of, of a storyline. And that, that brings us into the whole composition level. So mm -hmm. let's, let's go back a little bit more. Mm -hmm. How did music enter your life? and How young were you when you first started getting involved with music? Well, uh, since I can remember, my mother, which you met I in know, Milwaukee. I know, what a doll she is. She's, wonderful she's wonderful. And yeah. she, she's a you know, flower child. Mm. She was listening to all kinds of great music from the 60s, uh, mostly rock and roll. Mm. So that's what I grew up listening to. So for me, it was a natural thing to just kind of get uh, attracted to that kind of music. Mm. My mother, Susana, who uh, has a brother, Ignacio Ignacio, had a girlfriend, Ana, and Ana had a brother, Fito. <laughs> and Fito was a drummer. <laughs> so one day I was hanging out with my uncle and then we went to Ana's house because he wanted to see his girlfriend. We walked in the door and it was my first time there and I saw a Ludwig Vistalite kid oh, just man. sitting on the, on the living room. <laughs> I knew what a drum set was, of course, because I, was, I had already seen videos uh, you know, yeah. and, and pictures of, of all these bands that I was telling you about. And I was like floored, yeah. you know, just by the, the sheer looks. Just, yeah. It was just such a gorgeous instrument just yeah. sitting there, yeah. you know. And, and I remember it had a lot of boom stands, really, really thin boom stands that Ludwig used to make. Yeah. And they were all kind of facing the drum and he had a lot of cymbals. And I remember I came and I just like grabbed the stick and I played a couple of notes. And then Fito came running downstairs <laughs> like, who's playing my drums? <laughs> and I was like, I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, you, you, you want to? And then he sat down and he played Whole Lot of Love oh, along with Zeppelin, the record, Led yeah. Zeppelin. So <laughs> that, that did it for me. It was love at first sight. And then I started taking lessons with him. And my lessons would be just bringing my, my records, the, what I like listening to at yeah. home. And then he would, she showed me a little bit of technique and then just how to play along to the records. That was the beginning. So Fito really became a, a very important part of exposing you to get the feel of the instrument. Oh, yeah. Did you continue from there on taking lessons at all? Or what was the next step? I mean, I was doing that with him and then I would just be playing at home all yeah. the time. I was obsessed. I've, I've always been a very obsessive uh, person. Yeah. I, I don't grab, hold on to a lot of things, but whatever I, I hold on to, I really 
kind of hold on <laughs> like to. Like a real <laughs> Yeah, my <laughs> mom will tell you about it. Uh, so that was luckily one of those things that yeah. I just, you know, couldn't let go. Yeah. So I would be studying a lot at home. And for me, it wasn't studying. It was just playing and yeah. fooling around and just enjoying myself. Yeah, yeah. So that, that was it. And then I started uh, taking lessons with somebody else. His name was uh, Tino Contreras, who was a famous drummer in Mexico, who taught me a little bit of, about jazz technique and a little bit about, you know, independence and swing yeah. and that kind of stuff. But it still wasn't my favorite thing. I, I, I just wanted to be, a, a you know, like a rock and roll player. And, and I had my rock bands and everything. And slowly I started getting disenchanted with the whole scene in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Because if we didn't have like a really charismatic singer and you know, we all had to have long hair, I never had long hair. Yeah. So, you know, it, it was just, you know, it, I started getting disappointed. This is Mexico City. This is Mexico yeah. City. Mm -hmm. And you know, we would do our little gigs all over town, but it, it was just seemed obvious that it, it was a lot more than just music. It mm -hmm. had to have the right image and the right, you know, uh, timing for that image. Yeah. So I started getting a little frustrated with it. And, and in the meanwhile, I was practicing my butt off all the time. Yeah. And none of these other guys were in the band. So I started surpassing them very quickly. That led me to, you know, slowly and organically to jazz. Mm -hmm. I have to say, my mom tried to play me an R. Blakey record <laughs> when I was into my Neil Paird rush and then <laughs> Stuart Copeland uh, with the police stage and she played it and I was like, The what? jazz yeah. messengers, that must have been a completely on the I, I other like, side of the world. You know, where's, where's this? Where's the backbeat? <laughs> and you know, whenever I hear a shuffle, I was like, oh, okay, that, that's kind of cool. But you know, I was, I was just not ready for it. Yeah. You know, it, it took a while for me to get back in, into all that stuff. Where did piano come in? Was it, were you playing piano at an early age too? <laughs> well, there was a few things. There was a guitar always lying around the house. We didn't have a piano, mm -hmm. but any, anything that I could play, I, I would pick and I would just make up stuff. Right. I really wanted a little keyboard or something, but I was so preoccupied with, with just drumming yeah. that it hadn't entered my consciousness really. Right. But then I saw that movie that, that probably most people remember, Amadeus. Yes by Milos Forman. Amadeus Mozart, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that movie blew me away because it was about a kid prodigy, you know, yeah. and, I, and I was a kid too. Yeah. So I was like, man, I want, I, I want to play like that and I want to be a prodigy like that. Which, of course, you know, we all know there's only one, one, <laughs> one Mozart. But that got me interested in, in the piano and composition and classical music. So then I applied to go to the conservatory in Mexico and I got accepted. They told me, for us to accept you, you need to study one year of piano before. Hmm. So I, I took piano lessons for a year. And then when I got uh, admitted to the conservatory, you know, I, I was, you know, decent. Hmm. And uh, I started taking it all in. Uh, Chopin, Debussy, Mozart, of yeah. course, Beethoven. I, I just loved all that stuff. Did and you learn piano techniques? The, yes. All yeah, the fingering? Yeah, yeah. The, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was very formal. It was yeah. classical Great. Uh, training. But in the conservatory, there was an ongoing jazz workshop. Hmm. I would be practicing my, my WC and my Chopin, and I would be listening to the big band or like a small combo playing. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> what is that? You know? And, and I, 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 after my lesson, I would always make it down there and just try to see what, what they were doing. Yeah. And slowly, you know, I remember one day, they were playing and I saw, it was like a big band and I saw, you know, I, I had been practicing, playing classical piano, so it was all very noted. Written out, you know, everything is written. Everything is yeah. completely written out. Yeah. And then I go to the big band rehearsal and I look at the drummer's chart and it's just a bunch of little slashes. <laughs> And I'm like, what is that? I mean, I, I didn't understand a thing. And, and to me, it was very intriguing. Yeah. You know, so I started asking around and, and then somebody said, you know, listen to this. If you like rock and roll, you know, you might, you might dig this. So I went home and I played it and it was the Chicory Electric Band. Oh my gosh. With, with uh, Dave Weckl and oh my uh, Patty Tucci, of course, yeah. Chick, yeah. Uh, uh, Eric Marenthal and uh, Frank Ambali. 
So it had a lot of the elements that I love from rock. Yeah. Like big rock sound, uh, electric guitar, everybody's playing their butts off, yeah. but they're improvising you yeah. know, all the time, which for me, I loved improvising on the drums, but I never heard a band improvising like that. Mm. And then that was kind of like the back door for me into jazz. Mm. I started from fusion, uh, and then slowly started getting more into straight ahead jazz. Well, it's interesting, you know, a lot of the names that you're mentioning, and it's part of what I want the series to be. When you mention names like Frank Gambale and, of course, Michael and Patitucci, I want them to do the research so they understand mm -hmm. who these people are. I mean, I sat across from Chicken and, and had him talk, and it was so powerful to hear him speak about his, oh, yeah. his adventures and who he listened to. So we have to keep on going back. So when you mentioned Rush and Neil Peart and Bonham and all these guys, you got to go back. You know, when they want to understand Antonio Sanchez, they got to go back and listen to these, these albums and this stuff that you had done to understand what you went through. Oh, exactly. And, and for example, if we were talking about Chick Corea, which is one of the most creative forces that we've had in, in music in, yeah. in centuries. Yeah, yeah. You know, you have to go, I, I mean, I started with the Chicory Electric Band, but what he had done before that. Oh my gosh. You know, it's just like years and years of, of recording yeah. and playing. And then I started, you know, going that way Doing too. Doing the research, yeah. yeah. And then like, for example, I naturally got to, uh, it, now he sings, now he sobs with Roy Haynes. In it. <laughs> so I discovered Roy Haynes because I love Chick Corea Electric Band. So then all of a sudden I discover Roy Haynes. And I'm like, oh my God, what is this? <laughs> yeah, and then you start going back and, and forward and slowly, you know, you start putting dots together. Yeah, We're yeah. like, oh, so this guy plays like that yeah. because this guy existed before. In my generation, a lot of us thought jazz started with Weko or with the Vinny or with Peter Erskine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and then you start checking them out and they're like, oh, but wait, Steve Gadd and then Steve Gadd came from Lova. And then you start putting the dots Oh, you're back together. to Tony Williams. You exactly. go back to Art yeah, Blakey, like Philly, you said. Yeah. Philly Joe and yeah. Baby yeah. Dodds. And, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's... But that's it's, great that you had that level of curiosity that you kept on doing that research. That's because in your playing, you can really hear all those influences in your playing, Antonio. You really, you Thank pull you. from everybody all the time. And it's beautiful. When students ask me, how do you get your own voice? Mm. I tell them, you are unique because of who you are, where you were born, who your parents are, what you listen to. Right. So if I try to play like, you know, Dave Weckl or Roy Haynes or Tony Williams, you know, I did not grow up the way they did yeah. and I did not have the same influences they did. Yeah. So that's why they sound that way. Yeah. But we can sound unique if you let your influences flourish and go through you know i'm as influenced by chicoria as i'm what by mozart and the macarena <laughs> you know so uh, yeah. of course you 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 end up making the best out of your influences right. but you know we we should embrace everything that we are yeah. and that eventually will become into our own voices i think that's a very very powerful line that I, i'm glad that this next generation is hearing because to embrace everything Mm -hmm. that's, that's, yeah. that's something which you do very well. Yeah, well, I, I, I try. You know, I was a rock and roll snob in the beginning. Interesting. And then when I discovered all this other stuff, all these other colors that I've never <laughs> experienced, all these other flavors, uh, I was like, wow, I've been missing so much stuff. Yeah. And then I started eating everything as fast <laughs> as I could. So, yeah, I mean, I encourage everybody to check out all kinds of music. The only thing I tell them not to check out is reggaeton. That's the only thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> don't do that. That's, that's not going to help you in any way. <laughs> so you're in, in Mexico at this time. You're learning. So when did you make the move to, to start playing professionally and taking this thing more seriously? Well, you know, I was playing semi-professionally in Mexico with my right. bands. I was doing, you know, like corporate gigs here, corporate right. gigs there. But I, I was just generally a little frustrated because I felt like I was, you know, the best in the band always. Yeah. I wanted to be challenged. Mm. You know, I started trying to dig around what possibilities I had to go and study here in the, in the United States. And I saw Musicians Institute, of course, right. Berkeley College of Music. Musicians Institute seemed really cool, but it was only a one-year thing. Yeah, and time, yeah. I, I, I wanted something that would last a little longer to really yeah. sink my teeth into what I wanted to do. So luckily, Berkeley accepted me. They gave me a, a decent scholarship to yeah. start with. My mom put everything on her credit card and I remember I got there in 1993 and 
basically at the same time it was one of the worst devaluations of the Mexican oh. peso oh we've had gosh. in a long time. So she basically owed twice as much from one day to the next. Oh my gosh. So it was a rough time. I was almost about to have to come back because but we just didn't have the bread. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and luckily Right around that time, uh, Berkeley gave me uh, the Buddy Rich Memorial Scholarship. Yes, yes, yes. So that kind of started helping out financially, and then I got the Silgen Scholarship, and then you know a couple of different scholarships, yeah. and and then I was like, okay, I I, I think I'm cool now. Uh, but we finished p paying my mom's credit card. I mean, not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> Your mom is a saint at oh, middle she is. having she met is. her. What a beautiful person she is, she's and she's just, yeah. when you were performing and playing, the look in her face and just in her eyes, the depth of the appreciation of seeing you on stage performing at the event that we did, mm -hmm. you were playing and I was watching her, and it was just such a beautiful connection, so I think the rewards of how you paid her back is more so than any other way that... Uh, yeah, that well, you yeah, know, I, I, I always uh, think about those days when, yeah. when I... I remember one time I went to the ATM machine and I wanted to get a $10 bill when I was at Berkeley, a student, and I had like four bucks in my savings and like seven bucks in my checkings. So I couldn't get $10, so I had to transfer funds from one to another just to get a $10 bill. I remember that day, I was like, wow, this is, this is, this is rough. Yeah. But, you know, those things are really good mm -hmm. because it makes you humble and, and it makes you appreciate when things get better later. Mm -hmm. Hopefully they will. <laughs> well, in your life they have. I mean, because yeah. you went on and you persevered. You've got a real strong constitution of just going straight ahead and following your dream and your passion. So what happened at that point? You come out of Berkeley. What was the next step? So I was in Berkeley from 93 to 97. Right. And those were still the times where as an international student, I could still do part-time for some semesters. Mm. I, I called it the magic stretching visa. <laughs> so I wanted to stretch my visa as far as I, as it could go, yeah. and I was able to stretch it for from '93 to to '97, basically. Amazing. Uh, and then, because for Mexicans it was always hard. I mean, uh, everybody's visa would be for four years. My visa was for one year at a time, and I had to renew it all the time. It was just problematic in general. Yeah. I graduated in '97. While I was doing uh, Berkeley, I, of course, I wanted to be in the local scene and play around. And I started playing with teachers, with students. And one of the people that I met in the Boston scene, even though he doesn't really play in Boston, was Danilo Perez. Yes. I knew who Danilo was, and I had seen him perform before, so. I wanted to work with him because he was the only guy that lived in Boston that was playing internationally. I mean, he played with Dizzy Gillespie yeah. and with Roy Haynes, yeah. you know, so yeah. he was in direct contact with a lot of the people that I admired. I remember he was teaching at uh, New England Conservatory. So I finished Berkeley and I forgot to apply for my uh, practical training, which as an international student gives you an extra year just to hang out and be cool without having to study. So I completely spaced out <laughs> and I was like, I'm either I'm gonna have to go back to Mexico or go back to school. So luckily, New England Conservatory gave me a scholarship. So then I went in there kind of doing a, like a graduate diploma nice. uh, program. And I had the possibility of studying with two private teachers. So at that point I, I thought, you know, I've been studying with drummers my whole life. Yeah. I want to study with somebody that is not a drummer that but that will tell me what they need from me as a drummer. Nice. You know, so Danilo's a piano player and then I also studied with George Garcon who was a, mm. an amazing saxophone yeah, player. Yeah, yeah. So I would have weekly lessons with both of them and they were great. I mean with Garzon we would just play standards or play free and uh, I mean playing standards was the best thing because uh, I had been playing a lot of standards uh, at Berkeley but George really can take it out yeah, yeah. so you know I'm trying to, to keep the form in you my head. You gotta know the form, you gotta know the changes, you yeah. gotta know everything. Yeah, yeah you have to know uh, and, you, and you have to keep your place in the music yeah. and, and sometimes I'll be like man I'm, I, are we playing free or are we still playing <laughs> the standard and then boom he would come at the top of the head with something like Wow. So okay, cool. So, <laughs> so I, I was really, really focusing on that, on on and, and form, especially, which is so important uh, for drummers, yes. as you yes. know. And then my other lesson was with Danilo. So 
my evil plan right from the get-go was to learn all of Danilo's music and then come to the lesson prepared and be like, so Danilo, how does this tune of yours go that I love, by the way? Uh, Panamonk was one of the tunes. And I was like, well, it goes like this. And then I would start playing it. And like, oh, you know it? I'm like, yeah, 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 kind of. You know? <laughs> and then I, I basically knew his whole repertoire. And then he was like, man, that, that's fun. Why don't you bring a bass player next time? And then, you know, we play some of the music. And our lessons would be just him kind of unknowingly grooming to be in his band. How beautiful, smart. So that was great that we had that weekly thing going on. And then one day, of course it happened, his drummer at the time, Jeff Ballard, couldn't do a couple of gigs. And then his manager came in like, who are we gonna get? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> And then he was like, him, he knows everything. I'm like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm available. <laughs> so I remember we went to Paris for a couple of days and it went well. And then he recommended me to go on the road with Paquito de Rivera and the United Nations Orchestra. That was in 1997, right after Berkeley. So here you are, he, he, he takes you on tour. So right from, he says, join the band, you fly to Paris. Yeah, actually, the way it happened is that I did a couple of little gigs with him in Boston. Yeah. And then... He told me, I recommended you for something. I'm not sure if it's going to happen or not. It was Paquito. Yeah. So then they called me. I did this great, my first European tour yeah. all over Europe. Great band. And then I came back and I started New England Conservatory. Interesting. Okay. Studying with him. Yeah. So it was great studying with him. But after having been on tour, you know, <laughs> school seemed like a, like a horrible place to be, <laughs> you know, uh, but I'm glad I did it because then I really got to know Danilo. And then right after that is when he started calling me for his band. Okay. And then I just did one year of the two-year program because we were on the road all the time after that. That was 97, 98. And what happened with your visa at that time? So I applied for an artist visa, which Danilo sponsored for the first time. Beautiful. So then I had my, my first three years of being worry-free. Uh, at least I can work and, and tour and all that stuff. How beautiful, how absolutely yeah. fantastic. So you're, now, you're, now you're traveling, you're touring. This is a whole other world now. That's, that's where I wanted to be, you know, that's what we usually... That's what we strive, that's exactly. what we, that's what we, that was in your dream, that was your vision, and you achieved it. Now you're playing, how are you maintaining your playing on the road? Uh, well, you know, I had been practicing so much up to that point that I had a lot of, uh, the facility and everything. Yeah, yeah a lot yeah, of, yeah. But, but it was so easy to play by reflex for me, you yeah. know. But I had never played at the level that Danilo was asking me to play, you know, which was completely interactive. So, uh, you know, the way you set up on a piano trio, the piano player is there, the bass is in the middle, and the drummer kind of faces the, the piano player. Yeah. And right from the first day, I was like, oh, great, I'm going to play with Anilo. And then I start playing, and then he's like... <laughs> and I kind of like freaked out. I was like, whoa, what are you doing? <laughs> so it was really, really intense. And, and he wanted me to kind of react to every single thing he was doing, and, and it was overwhelming. Yeah. So in the beginning, after every gig, I swore I was going to get fired, and I had a headache. <laughs> because it was so focused, the, the playing was so focused, I was just not used to that. So talk about when you were singing in Mexico, where you were the best one in the band at that time, now all of a sudden you are like... All of a sudden I suck, which, <laughs> which, which is great, you know, because that's, uh, be, uh, be careful what you wish for. But, but yeah, in, in that moment I thought I couldn't do anything, you know, and, and of course, uh, the more nervous I would get, the more insecure I would get. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's just kind of like a, a mind thing that yeah. starts taking over. And Danilo, I think he was a little abused by some band leaders in the past. Uh, I remember he told me stories. Yeah. So I think he learned a little bit from that. And, and he, would, he would do some things in the bandstand, kind of vibing me out. Uh, playing a little bit of, of mind games, which, you know, at the end, it, it all worked out to my advantage. But at that moment, I was like, man, I, I was kind of going crazy. It was, yeah. it was really, really hard. And I would be playing and, you know, he would do something and I would try to answer. And then he would stop playing and just like cross his arms and look at me like, I can't <laughs> believe you just play that. I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, I, I, it, was, it, was, it was hard. On you know, the job training. Yeah. 
it was this is baptism very by intense, fire yeah. at the level. Yeah, and it was trio playing, which is you know you you don't get a break. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And we were traveling all over the place for months at a time, and it was you know it was a great education, yeah. great great education. And also there, that's when I learned how to play at a really soft volume, mm. because sometimes we'll be playing some church in Italy with basically no amplification and drums from 1950 with heads from 1950. <laughs> and uh, in order for me to hear the piano, I would have to play so soft. And, and I started developing you know, a touch that would be able to adapt yeah, to, yeah. to that volume. Which is beautiful because your touch, even at a low volume, is still intense and, and exciting. Thank you. I that's mean, that's rare. That's one of the hardest things to do to Absolutely. play with intensity at a low volume yeah. and not have the tempo drop. Yeah. Yeah. You know, all those those things are, are really hard. But like I said, it was just training on the job. Yeah. And and I had enough facility to do it. It yeah. was more putting the concept in in my mind, train my hands a little bit for that kind of volume. Mm. But it was it, Danilo was very. Uh, good in teaching me about interaction and how to be in the moment, mm -hmm. you know, a hundred percent. You cannot be regurgitating yeah. licks that right. you learned before. Right. Right. You know, right. you, I, I want you here with me. Yeah. Talk about that for a second, because because I, I, I'm I'm currently writing a book called Owning Now about, about mm -hmm. being in the moment, and you mm -hmm. talked about that also at the event that we did together. Being in that moment, that really is where the magic is in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, the best music. Uh, but if we're going to talk about jazz, jazz is the kind of music where whatever one person plays influences the other people in right. real time. Right. You know, so it, it can create a shock wave if I play a cymbal to everybody. Yeah. You know, if you're not really there listening, watching, looking, and you're not 150% immersed in the moment, mm. you're going to miss out on a lot of stuff that is yeah. happening. It's like a conversation. You're yeah. having a conversation between yeah. four or five people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to be laying the foundation for the, for the conversation, but interacting, saying stuff, yeah. not saying too much, but don't <laughs> say too little, keep it interesting. You know, it's all these things that you have to, yeah. to be worrying about for it to really do what it needs to do, yeah. for it to be exciting for you and for everybody else and, for listeners, and, yeah. and that's what I always tell people man if if you go uh, to a bad jazz gig I mean I want to cut my veins and then <laughs> I want to cut their veins too <laughs> you know slash my wrist because there. nothing happens <laughs> yeah you yeah, know because yeah. everybody's kind of just like and and jazz can be one of the most vilified mm, kind, yeah, kinds of music yeah. if it's not done yeah. right yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, at least kids playing a rock band, even if they're not that great, maybe the energy can make up for it. Yeah. You yeah. know, or the look or, you know, the vibe. But jazz is so hard if you don't really know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. It's just nothing happens. You know, I, I always tell kids, you know, you have to have the radar up yeah. all the time, yeah, all yeah. the time scanning. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's the bass player doing? What's the piano player doing? What am I doing? Yeah. You know, am I too loud? Am I too soft? Yeah. What is what, what was the, the reaction of the audience? I mean, you, ha you have to look at everything all the time, especially because when you're playing jazz, you're taking chances, yeah. you know, usually. There's always risk, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I remember we talked that time that I defined a jazz musician as somebody that is comfortable being uncomfortable. Absolutely. You know, because you never know exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. But we never know what's going to happen when, when we wake up and go into the street. In you, life. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. we have a, a game plan. Okay, I knew I was going to come here today. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I drove and I had to go a million times like this just to not hit people, right? And, or, or other cars. So you're improvising yeah. Yeah. in a way all the time. So you're uncomfortable yeah. because you don't know what's going to happen, but you've done it so many times that you yeah. know you can do it. And that's a great analogy in, in how, how this next generation needs to understand that. Where did composition come in? You know, I always had a, a thing for composition. Right from, from when I would grab the classical guitar that was lying around the house, yeah. I was uh, always trying to make little songs or something. Yeah. And then when I started studying piano, because Mozart was such an accomplished composer, I was like, yeah. man, I want to write too. And I, I, you know, I, I had some really funny compositions that were like Mozart-like. Yeah. Uh, and those were my, my first tries. And then I started taking lessons a little bit more formally and then analyzing classical music mm. for forms and structures, right. you know, and motivic development. I remember looking at Mozart's scores yeah. 
and be like, oh, okay. So the teacher would explain, so look at this melody, see where it comes back, but now it comes back a third down. And then it comes back in a minor instead of a major. <laughs> yeah. And then you're like, wow. So, you know, it's basically one thing that he's just turning around in a, in a million different ways. So yeah. that's motivic development, you know, yeah. talking about the same thing and developing it in, in, in different ways so that the ear doesn't get tired, but it's familiar. Mm. You know, you, you, you're talking about, you can, you can see the story, yeah. you know, you can feel the story. So I was always interested in that, and, and, uh, but I was always kind of shy. And then, you know, the reputation drummers have for, <laughs> you know, being the best, you know, the musician's best friend and all that <laughs> stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was a little shy in, in the beginning because I feel I didn't know harmony as well as a piano player did or as a guitar player did or right. as a saxophone player did. Because they, they are working with that all the time. Absolutely. Every time they're on stage Absolutely. or they're practicing, they're dealing with that. But we're not. Mm. You know, we hear, we must hear changes harmony but we we don't necessarily know or have to know what each chord change is right, right. as long as you can feel it and you can, can can see the color then you you know you can do a really good job absolutely for that reason I, I was I was shy with my composition my first record I had a great band but I was writing for bass and two saxophones so it was very linear it was I, it was hard and scary for me to put a lot of chords into stuff. So a yeah. lot of uh, a lot of things were vamps, oh, where we just you know have a great time playing you know over a certain vamp, and then do a little chord change into something else. And then slowly, when I started working with uh, Matheny, I started really appreciating chords. Yeah, because he's the one of the masters of master chord that. changes. His you know? Changes in his voices yeah. are just so beautiful. And melodies too. Yeah, totally. So I, I learned so much from yeah. just playing with him, watching him play, hearing him play, and then analyzing his compositions and mm -hmm. then getting instruction from him. Interesting. So that that was another school altogether that uh, kind of opened the harmonic door for me. And it was like even if I don't know what exact chord it is, man, you can just move your fingers a little bit and, and then hear different nuances. Yeah. If I move one finger to this note, what does it do? Yeah. And then this one. So even guitar players write on the piano for that reason a lot of times, you know, because it's so graphic. Yeah. Starting basically on my third record, I started losing a little bit of the fear that I had towards harmony. And then I was like, Man, I'm just gonna go for it, you know. <laughs> even 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 if it doesn't really work, I'm yeah. just, I I have to try. It. And and the, I felt like that that third record, which is called New Life, was like a a departure point for me uh, compositionally. Interesting. Yeah. And now sometimes you know people complain that I write too many chords. You know? <laughs> <laughs> <In my band. laughs> well, how apropos, New Life really kind of opened up yeah. a whole nother way of exactly. being able to I express mean, yourself. It, that's why I gave it that title, because mm. it was like a, a departure for me. And also, as a band leader, yeah. I was like, okay, I, I want to do this, you know, uh, uh, seriously now. How beautiful. Now, where did Birdman come in? This is, this is a really interesting story, because when I was growing up in Mexico, there was a really good uh, station, radio station called 96.9 WFM. And I used to listen to that all the time. Mm. And they played the hippest music in Mexico back then. There were two DJs that I liked. One was Martin Hernandez and the other one was Alejandro Gonzalez Iñárritu, the director of Berman. Mm -hmm. So he was a DJ way before he got into film and all that stuff. Yeah. And I was a fan of his musical taste. And then they used to have a nightly show called Magic Nights, where they would play a little bit more sophisticated music. And one night, I'm listening to the radio, and this song comes on. I was like, wow, that's, that's really cool. What is that? And it had like a sitar sound. I didn't know what even a sitar was, <laughs> but, but I, I, I recognized it was not a guitar. It was something different. And, and it had really haunting voices, like a really haunting melody with no lyrics. It was just the voices. Mm. And in really lush harmony and a really kind of hypnotic beat with brushes. I was like, man, that's so cool. Uh, and I was still in my rock stage back then. So I was like, man, I've never heard anything like this before. So I waited until the end of the track and then a voice uh, said, this was Last Train Home by the Pat Metheny Group. I was like, wow, Pat Metheny Group. It was the first time I heard of them. So then 
because of Iñárritu, I started checking out Pat Metheny. <laughs> so then, fast forward many, many years, and in 2001, I, I get the gig with the Pat Metheny group. Fantastic. And we're playing that tune and <laughs> a bunch of other <laughs> tunes, and we're doing a tour in 2005, uh, and we're at the Universal Amphitheater in uh, L.A. We played this show, which uh, it was called The Way Up, the tour, because it was a, a through composed thing that lasted like an hour and a half. Mm. And then Pat would introduce the band and then we would play for another hour and a half. So it was like uh, three hours, 15, like straight. And it, yeah. it was brutal with a click track, really complicated music. Yeah. It was, but it was it was great, you know, yeah. and, and I was still young enough that I was like, <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> I don't know if I could now. But I, you know, every night I, I would give it my all and I would be just completely exhausted at the end. And I remember there was an after party afterwards. So I'm walking towards my dressing room and I'm going through the after party and I'm all sweaty and I just want to get to my dressing room and, and change. <laughs> and I, I hear it, I feel a tap and I turn around as this guy is like, man, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of the Pat Metheny group. I've been a fan for a long time and I'm from Mexico. I know you're from Mexico and I'm so proud that you're playing. And I'm like, oh, thanks, man. And I'm like trying to leave. <laughs> <laughs> but he seemed really nice. So I stayed and, uh, and talking, I asked him, so what do you do? And I was like, oh, you know, I direct films and commercials. Uh, very unassuming. And since we're in LA, I, I thought everybody directs films and commercials, so I wasn't particularly impressed. I asked him anything I would have seen, not really expecting much, and he said, well, I did this thing called Amores Perros and 21 Grams, and I'm like, oh my God, you are a and I'm like, oh, yeah. I gave him a huge hug, I was like, wow, man, I'm a now huge Now the connection fan. happens. We exchanged numbers, super cool, down-to-earth guy. Uh, and we stayed in touch. Every time he would come to New York for uh, one of his premieres, he would invite me. If I came to LA to play, I would let him know. Mm. So, you know, it was always through email, but every time we would, so we would see each other, it was super nice. Yeah. And then one day, uh, I'm in Miami driving a rental car with my wife and her grandmother. We're coming out of the, of the symphony hall. And I'm, I'm driving and I feel my phone ringing and I, I look at it and it says Alejandro González Iñárritu, which he never called me which I thought, this is odd, so I'm going to pick this up. <laughs> <laughs> so I, oh, hello, Antonio, this is Alejandro. Um, I'm working on my next film, it's going to be a dark comedy, and uh, I think the whole score should just be drums. What do you think, are you in? I'm like, uh, but yeah, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. Uh, okay, I'll send you the script, all right, I'll talk to you later. And I hang up and my wife was like, what the hell was that? <laughs> I was like, well, I think Iñárritu just offered me his next film, but to do it with just drums. She's like, what? I'm like, I know, that's bizarre, right? And so in the beginning, I was like, wow, this is amazing. You know, I was elated. And then two seconds later, I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? You know, I was like, this is impossible to do a Hollywood film with just drums. So I was petrified, petrified. Okay. But, but then I thought, he knows what he's doing, you know. Yeah. I got home and the script was already waiting for me. So I started reading it and, you know, if anybody that has seen the movie, it's kind of a weird movie. It's totally weird. You know, yeah, it's, totally. It's, uh, it, it, it goes to different dimensions yeah, yeah. Of, the, of the psyche yeah. and, and our ego and it has so many layers, you know. So I'm reading it and I'm like, what the hell is this? <laughs> uh, and, you know, I've never read scripts either. so. I was like, it's not, it doesn't have the same t subtext as a book that yeah. they explain everything to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I don't understand a lot of what's going on. And then I finish it and I remember, man, he told me it was a dark comedy. I did not laugh once. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And then put drums on top of this. <laughs> this is going to be, people are going to hate me. You know? But I kept thinking, no, 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 no. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Because he knows what he's doing. Yeah. So then he asked me, can you send me some, some demos? I was like, okay. Uh, so I, th I thought, you know, trying to be like a composer, uh, like, you know, John Williams would do, okay, maybe I'll do a rhythmic theme for Michael Keaton. Right. And every time you see him, it's that theme. And another theme for Ed Norton. Yeah. And then like a scary theme and then like a, you know, romantic theme. And, and I was trying to think in those terms. Very structured. Yeah. And uh, I sent him the demos, and a couple of days later, he writes me, and he was like, man, these are beautiful. I love them, except they're exactly the opposite of what I'm looking for. 
uh, great start. Uh, <laughs> so what, what, what are you looking for? And he said, well, you know, I just, I just want something that's jazzier, more organic, kind of improvised. And I'm like, well, that, that's great because yeah. that's kind of what I do. <laughs> you do, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so then the next step was they started shooting the movie here in New York. Him and I got together at Avatar Studios, now um, Power Station again, but Berkeley. And we got together uh, with the script. There was nothing for us to see yet because they had just started shooting it. Yeah, yeah. So then we worked off the script. So he would explain each scene to me in great detail and just kind of have me improvise, which was a very unorthodox approach, as, as you can yeah, imagine. Yeah. But it was great because it was very liberating. Yeah. He just completely let me do my thing. And of course, he would have suggestions. And these are long scenes. The, the, the movie is kind of like one long scene. Mm -hmm. So then he would explain the whole scene. And I was like, okay, why don't you sit here with me in front of the drums? And to get the timing that you have in your head, think of the scene. I, I, I think of the scene as well. Yeah. And whenever you see the next face of the scene, like somebody opening a door, then raise your hand so that I know that that's when you're looking at it. And, and he's like, okay, let's do that. So then I'm like, you know, improvising and all of a sudden he goes like, like that. And then, okay, so he opened the door. So, shh, you know, and then I changed to something else. So we did the whole movie like that. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was really, really weird, cool and, and fun. Yeah. You know? And then they took those demos, he took them, and they actually rehearsed with those demos so that the actors would kind of get a feel for yeah. what it was going to be like. Because yeah, yeah. he would say, you know, uh, somebody's not going to walk through a hallway the same way in that silence that then if you're chum, 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 chum. So I thought that was really smart too. And then they chopped up the demos, they superimposed them on the rough cut of the film. Uh, and then they brought me to LA, they showed me the movie. Inyaritu told me, you know, uh, I want more of this, less of that, and we did the whole thing again, which was just a day and a half. Really? So, yeah. so you're, you're watching the movie yeah. as you're playing this, and you're seeing when these scenes change? Right, so they have a, just a little monitor, a TV monitor, yeah. and, and we listen and we see the scene with the drums, and then he's like, you know, I, I love what's there, but I need you know, right. louder here, or whenever you hear this word, stop there. And then when you hear this word, start again. Yeah. You know, so he would guide me like that. And one of the things he wanted me to really change was the, the drum sound. Because he told me, look, this movie happens in the bowels of an old Broadway theater. Yeah. So your drums sound too good, you know, for <laughs> this. Because they sound in tune and, you know, beautiful. Uh, I want them to sound like they've been in storage for 50 years, you know. <laughs> Well, okay, let me, let me think about that. So I started, you know, detuning and putting tape on the drums and just, just putting cymbals on top of the drums and towels and yeah. just kind of trying to find different ways of make the drums sound like something that I wasn't used to. Yeah. Uh, and that also made me play differently, of course, you know, having the drums sound in a completely different way that I'm, that I'm used Absolutely. to. So uh, that was interesting in, in that regard as well. Basically, at the end, what you hear in the movie is a little bit of the combination of the second session we did looking at the movie. And he did like some of the original demos and he left uh, bits and pieces in there too. So the, is there a full score written out now of what you have done? I, I don't think so. I mean, unless somebody has, has done it. Well, that would be a good exercise for students to do. Yeah. I, actually, you know, there's a, a bunch of people that do... Uh, film and music that have done their thesis on on the score and they've sent me the thesis and you know different people all over the world so it's it's really cool you know i'm i'm aware that that was the first score that had you know so much drums in in in, in a hollywood movie i Absolutely. mean they had been jazz in hollywood of, of, right, for, right, for right, sure right. but just a, a solo drum score you know that was that that, that hadn't been done like that Fantastic, fantastic to see. You know, the, the, the business side of all this here, how do you schedule all this here? How do you organize yourself? Are, are you, are you are Still you trying a, to <laughs> figure it out. <laughs> the, the thing is, I, I see it as, you know, you're a juggler, you know, and you have three, three balls going. Yeah. And you're doing it really well. Yeah. Right? And then somebody comes and like, man, I have this 
beautiful shiny ball. Do you, do you want it? Uh, I'm like, uh, yeah. And then uh, it gets harder, right? Yeah, 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 but yeah. You, you really want that ball because it's yeah. beautiful. And yeah. then somebody else comes like, man, I have this ball that they're really interested in you juggling it too. <laughs> so uh, I'm like, okay. So at, all of a sudden you're juggling, you know, five, six, seven different balls. Yeah. And it can get a little overwhelming. So. Uh, I think you have to know your limitations and when the most you can do without the work suffering, right, you know, the right. quality of your work suffering. You, you have to learn how to say no, although it's really hard to say no when everything that comes your way is something that you're interested in. Yeah, it's easy to say no when somebody asks you to do something you don't want to do. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know? But if it's all interesting, uh, uh, creative, challenging stuff, it's like, man, I really want to want to do it. See what happens. You know? yeah. But it can get it can get a little crazy. Uh, for example, lately, the the what's been hard for me is like I'm doing the score for Get Shorty yes. for the TV series with Ray Romano and Chris O'Dell, which is a lot of fun. It's mostly drums. I do all of that at home, and I just send them to to LA. Yeah. But you know, they are very regimented in when they need it. For example, if I'm touring with Matheny, which sometimes I, it'd be a month or a month and a half straight, and then I'm going straight to one of my tours right, right after, and then they need three episodes, you know, done, I have to fly home and do three episodes like in two days, which can get a little uh, stressful, of yeah, course. Yeah. But you start getting used to a certain certain pace, which I know at this point in my life, it's kind of what it is. I don't intend on keeping that pace for, for my whole life because it's not very healthy yeah. either. Uh, we have to take care of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, our creative juices are not gonna fl uh, flow as right, well, right. I think. You know? It's difficult when opportunity and good opportunity arises and I know how I was at a time in my life when I wasn't making a lot of money. All of a sudden, when good opportunity comes up, exactly. you want to push yourself, which it seems like what you do, Antonio. You seem to push yourself to this next level, and then you adapt to it, and then you're at this level, and then I also I'll notice you do something else. Even like with Get Shorty, this is, this is intense. This is fantastic. It's a whole other realm of what you're doing, yeah. and it seems to build to even the next level, which we don't know what that is for you yet. Exactly. I mean, that, that's what it's so interesting for me. If you would have asked me, where do you see yourself in five years, five years ago, I would have never told you, yeah. do music for a TV series yeah. or do a movie. Yeah, you know, yeah. that, that was yeah. never in my, in my horizon, yeah. on my radar. But, of course, it happened and I would be stupid not to, to do it more yeah. because I loved it and it was so much fun. <laughs> and, and also, I have to say, as jazz musicians, my generation already didn't see any financial benefit from record sales. Right. Right. You know, I have eight records out. I basically have not seen one penny from, from any of them because I just needed to sell it enough so that I can make the next record, mm. you know. Like, for example, Pat's generation, Chick Corea's generation. Yeah, it was a different world. Yeah, completely very, very different. different you could make money yeah. out of record yeah. sales. Yeah. But now our generation with... Uh, and the generations after me, yeah. the millennials and all that stuff with with streaming and Spotify and Apple Music, you know, is just so intangible now. Yeah. You know, you yeah. get, you, it's hard to monetize yeah. Yeah. What, yeah. what you're doing. So that's one thing I, I like about TV and film, that it's a little bit more tangible and they kind of are a little bit more together in the sense of, uh, I think, piracy and then giving the artists their fair share. Yeah more than what streaming services are doing for, for musicians nowadays. Interesting, that, that's very, very powerful. That really is very, very powerful that you're, that you're that attuned to have that industry open up to you to let you go down that path. Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is I saw the results from, uh, from Birdman. You yeah. know, uh, even though they paid me a very modest fee because it was a, an independent film. And of course, you know, I mean, they ended up paying me a little bit more uh, because we, we fought it a little bit, but I, I'm not stupid. I'm, I'm not gonna not do a movie because it's not paying that right, well, especially right. with somebody I admire. And it's gonna be a Hollywood movie with a drum score. I mean, I would be stupid to Absolutely. be like, oh, Absolutely. it's too little. Because I knew, I knew probably the rewards would come later. Yeah, yeah. And, and they have come, you know, in, in, in many different ways. Recognition, of course, name mm -hmm. recognition. Uh, financially, just from, from uh, the movie doing well, yeah. I saw the results later, so then I, I'm like, okay, 
this is completely different than the jazz. Thing, you know? <laughs> the jazz You're tapping yeah. into a, a, a whole new world that I just you know, wasn't available to, to me before, and it's not available to many people, so I'm very fortunate. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. In closing, we have these people that are watching this and hearing your voice and hearing your story. What would you tell this next generation of how they could prepare themselves to achieve their dreams with, with music? You know, it's, it's a very interesting and difficult question because I think my generation, the generation after me, the generation before me, uh, I mean, even really successful established musicians have told me, man, I just don't know where this is going. Yeah. You know, with the record industry, with uh, streaming, with uh, Instagram, you, you know, with followers. Yeah. Uh, it's just the currency yeah. of, of your popularity and your success seems, seems to have shifted quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. Record labels, what are they doing, you know, with the streaming services? And then you as a musician, as an artist, how do you get, you know, your fair share? out of that mm -hmm. but you also want your product out there yeah i think it's a very interesting transitional period and for example i'm i'm on pretty much all social media platforms that kind of matter you know right. i'm on, i have my facebook fan page and my instagram page my twitter page right. and you know you start kind of realizing wow you, ca you kind of need to do those things yeah. nowadays like for example i know chick Korea, he has embraced all of that. He, I see Absolutely. him putting videos all the time on, on Instagram. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Herbie Hancock too. Some other people don't, just kind of, yeah. you know, they, they don't want to. And, yeah. and I respect that. But I think to get to the nuts and bolts of what people need nowadays to, to be successful, I think it's a combination of a lot of things. Mm -hmm. So I think kids nowadays, they can be very savvy with social media because they grew up with it, they yeah, were yeah. born with it. They're digital you know, natives, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. so they, they know how to work it really well. I think sometimes it goes overboard because it's so addictive that, I mean, it, it happens to me sometimes when I, uh, I realize how much I've been on my phone just doing nothing, yeah. I, I get scared. I'm like, wow, I, if I would have spent those two hours just doing something <laughs> worthwhile, you know, I could, speak like four languages by now, you know, <laughs> instead of two. So I think kids need to be very careful on how you're going to counteract. Yeah. So you have all this stuff over here and you need to put some substance, mm. you know. So uh, what is the substance is going to be obviously the, the, the time you're going to spend at your craft, yeah. uh, the time you're going to be spending educating yourself. The midterm election was, was yesterday. Now, I think it's a requirement to be also politically savvy yeah. because whatever it is that, oh, pff, I don't care about politics, you know. If you don't think politics are, it's important for you, you know, it, that will influence your career, your life in, yeah. in so many ways that you have just absolutely no idea. Absolutely. So I strongly recommend for everybody to just know a little bit of what's what's going on yeah. you know your morals your values uh, are gonna stand yeah. uh, what's right and what's wrong I don't see it as what's uh, conservative and what's democratic I, I see it more as what's right and yeah. what's wrong yeah. at this Good. point you know so I'm I'm a Mexican citizen and I'm an American citizen I suffer from both sides yeah you know, I see yeah. what the American uh, government is doing to the Mexican uh, <laughs> population in terms of just vilifying their image. Yeah, yeah. And then there's a caravan coming and, you know, it's like uh, everything uh, is like a nuclear war is approaching with this yeah, uh, caravan. Yeah, yeah. So you just have to be careful and, and aware of what's going on. And of course, don't, uh, you shouldn't skip steps. Uh, it's great to have thousands of followers on, on Instagram. But how are you going to turn that into a livelihood? Yeah. Maybe some people can and yeah. they know how to, but I like playing in front of people and writing music and have people listen to it. So yeah. if that's a tool for that, great. great. But if you have thousands of followers and nobody's going to come to see your show because all you do is put one minute videos of you playing by yourself, you know, then 
try to find a way to, to balance yeah. things out a little bit. You know, I, I think what we are lacking nowadays is a little bit of, of uh, substance mm -hmm. in general. I think there's a lot of uh, voyeurism and exhibitionism. Yeah. Uh, and social media is the, the ideal oh, uh, world for that to flourish. board for that. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So it, it, we just have to be careful on, uh, on where, we, where we stand with all of that and be careful that there's always some, some soul, you know, and heart behind whatever it is that we're trying to put out there. Well, absolutely fantastic. You do that consistently all the time. Thank there's you. deep soul, there's deep art. You are a creative treasure for us in the music industry. Oh, thank you, Don. Oh, seriously, Antonio, and even in the drumming industry. You've set a standard that you keep raising. You've set a bar that's inspiring many of the next generation to kind of move up that notch and play the game at a much more serious level. So you are absolutely leading that all the way through your career. Thank you so much. You have Thank been you fantastic, Antonio. Thank you. What a pleasure. My Thanks. pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>